students live and learn, providing the support required to infuse teaching and learning with evolving technology, driven by pedagogy and responsive to the world around us. This diagram outlines the work of the center in a little more visual way. Um, all of our work involves educational technologies and sound pedagogy. So these two circles overlap with all the other areas of focus. To the left, you can see the center supports a number of areas, including online and hybrid courses and programs, enhanced face-to-face -face courses like flipped classes and those that use active learning strategies, as well as our work in innovative learning spaces and our Apple one-to-one -one initiative, which you'll hear more about in a few minutes. The center also supports the dissemination of learning experiences to audiences outside our traditional student body. This includes professionals seeking continuing education, professional development, and executive education opportunities. We provide this through our Fisher Next platform, which I'll talk a little, mil a little more about later on. I'm really excited today to share an update with you on the staff within the center, um, as we've grown from an office of one to an office of four in just the last eight months. So as the director of the center, I oversee our work with online and hybrid programs, our work with learning spaces, our iFisher initiative, and our work on Fisher Next. Emma Dates joined Fisher and our team in December as educational technologists, providing support on a number of ed tech tools and a focus on our one-to-one -one initiative as well. Robin Schmidt transferred into the center in January from the Office of Information Technology. Robin's been with Fisher for almost 14 years and provides excellent support on a broad range of tools for both faculty, staff, and students. Tyler Woodward is our newest member of the team who joined Fisher in April. Tyler will primarily focus on the support of our online programs and the development of content for our Fisher Next platform. It's really exciting to have such a talented group of people working as a team to bring the mission of the center to life. Next, I wanna give an update on the physical construction of the center. Uh, the DePeters Family Center will be constructed in the upper level gateway of Basil Hall. The space will include offices for the staff, areas for one-to-one -one consultation with faculty and staff, a recording studio, and a prototype classroom space that will be used to hold workshops and events, as well as act as a test bed for future classroom innovations we'd like to explore and potentially implement across our campus. The construction of the space will take place this summer and the center will open in the fall 2021. Uh, these are the renderings of the prototype classroom space that will be part of the center. You can see the space does not look like a typical classroom. So we've designed the space with flexibility and mobility at the core of the design. All of the tables, chairs, whiteboards, even the power sources are on wheels and can be moved into different configurations in the space. You can see two potential layouts on the right, one for whole group experience and another where the room is divided in half to facilitate smaller workshops while allowing individuals or groups to, uh, to work in the open area that remains. The color of the chairs aligns with the carpet. So at the end of the event, things can be quickly reset without a lot of hassle. The room will be equipped, equipped with a number of technology options, including multiple projection sources, cameras and mics for recording, live presentations for remote attendees, and wireless projection from anywhere in the room. We're really excited about the space and how we can use it to facilitate exciting professional development events. And most importantly, so we can learn what aspects work well and that we'd like to take to the rest of the areas on campus. So this was kind of the general update on the center. And now I'd like to hand it over to Todd Harrison, who's gonna share an update specifically on the work in our learning spaces on campus. Thanks, Katie. As, uh, as they were talking a bit, um, they were giving the introductions. It was clear that Katie wrote her own uh, introduction because she is somebody that doesn't promote herself too much. And so uh, the work that she has done over the last 10 years, uh, and then especially to prepare the college for <clears throat> success, uh, whether it's through technology or whether it's through trainings or whether it's just through supporting student learning, uh, allowed the college to uh, be in a position last March uh, to pivot to make sure that it's student experiences and that our learning opportunities were where they were. And so like Katie's work uh, over that time uh, is really starting to bear fruit. And I don't know of really anybody on campus that has played a more important role over the last 17 months or so uh, to get us through the pandemic, through the 20 school year and then the 2021 school year. And so 
um, I am sort of here uh, partially to to stand Katie Saborn, who's out, out, like a rock star. Um, so with that said, I wanted to sort of talk a bit about the work that we have spent uh, the last couple of years uh, engaging in. And so this picture struck us uh, in this time because the picture on the left is a room from Kearney uh, from some time in the past, and I don't know the specific year, but uh, a day gone by. And the room on the right is an actual picture of the same room in this year. So we see that there has been some developments, but not a lot. And this room on the right is certainly not a uh, is not a, an example of every classroom on campus, but that it exists here uh, led the led us over the last couple of years uh, from Provost Rayleigh uh, and Stacy Slocum in Information Technology to push forward an effort to create a strategic plan so that we can make our classrooms like the Carney room on the right become more fit for 21st century learning, uh, the technology that comes with that and the other pieces. And so after me, Mike Bowler will talk a bit about the Apple technologies. My role here is primarily as discussing the canvas, the learning spaces themselves, so that all of the technology and all of the different things that professors can do uh, can be put into place. And so our work has been um, centered on the rooms themselves. And so can we go forward a slide? And so two years ago, uh, we began this process of in looking at the learning spaces on campus and making sure that they were more innovative. And what do we mean by innovative? Uh, that means something different for every person. Uh, if I am somebody that has lecture as a primary component of my experience or small groups or Mike Bowler has uh, technologies and there is a biology class where there is a simulation that occurs, making sure that the spaces themselves are flexible enough so that I can teach at 10 o'clock in the way that can maximize my style and Mike can teach at 11 o'clock in a way that maximizes his style. And so Katie and I and Eileen Lynn Balta and Stacy Slocum and Chad Goulet had worked with a number of faculty on campus, faculty, uh, staff, students, and administrators to create a strategic plan. And on the left here are the three primary goals that we set as part of that strategic plan. And you can read them to increase the number of innovative and flexible classroom spaces or learning spaces on campus to provide development and support to the faculty and the students that use those spaces. And then to establish processes for faculty to be assigned to the spaces that meet their teaching styles and formats. And so on the right in this picture is a, uh, a model, a design of a classroom. And I think this is 207 in Basel that uses because at the moment, uh, that classroom just has chairs and desks at it, and they're in rows. And there is some flexibility if you really want to push things around. But all of the chairs here are on casters. Uh, the tables themselves all move. All of the whiteboards move. So that there is flexibility so that each of the faculty members and each of the students, whether you're in a group of three or a group of six or a large group of 25, like they're able to engage and create classes, classroom experiences and learning experiences that fit all of the variety of topics that we are engaging in. And so this picture on the right is actually, uh, if you were to come back onto campus next in the fall, the room itself will look very much like this. And our work as an advisory board is to think of ways that we can create learning spaces on campus and work within the structures of the college to build out our classrooms, to move them from that Carney Hall room that we had on the last slide, more to the room that we have on the right. And so the spaces themselves are really, as I had said before, the canvas, the, the, the platform on which all of the initiatives and all of the work that Mike's group and Mike and Katie and the, and the uh, Apple Learning Initiative will be sort of building on. And so next, Mike will talk about that work um, that they're going on to. Sorry. Uh, and then this is sort of where we are, right? From a from a timeline perspective, right? We had built out um, the classrooms, the, the, the learning spaces themselves, that there was a charge February of 2019 
to go out and engage in these spaces. And Chad Goulet and OIT and myself went out to Anaheim and then spent last school year creating a strategic plan that would engage these pieces. And then just as we were actually getting ready to launch forward, we had submitted a grant application for a classroom and that there was some movement, uh, COVID became a thing. And we had to, again, work on some of the sort of transitions to kind of the spaces. So this afternoon, we will meet again with this learning space design advisory board. And we are working on ways to engage classrooms and things like the DePeters Family Center and start to implement these pieces. And Katie has been the driving force behind all of this work. And we're really excited to see some of the next pieces that we have going on. All right, well, I'm happy to talk about this technology piece that we've got going on um, with our uh, iFisher Next Generation Learning Initiative. Um, I'm gonna start by um, having, I'm gonna play this video, which is what we've been sharing with people. Collaboration, connection, next generation learning. Imagine a world where your digital knowledge outranks that of your peers. An environment in which you, your professors and mentors, as well as your classmates, engage in high quality multimedia learning experiences that lead to better academic and career outcomes. This will be your experience through the iFisher Next Generation Learning Initiative. iFisher will transform the teaching and learning experience that is provided to Fisher students. Through iFisher, you will receive an iPad, keyboard, and Apple Pencil beginning in your first year that will stay with you throughout your Fisher experience. Strengthen collaboration, increase critical thinking, and expand your creativity through this technology and integrated approach, all with an eye toward your career readiness for the complex global and digital world around us. With this collaboration and connection at your fingertips, you will be better prepared for your life at Fisher and beyond. See yourself succeeding thanks to iFisher and gain the academic, professional, and ethical skills required to be a successful digital citizen. And we have special thanks to the uh, communications office for helping us put that or uh, putting that video together because it really does speak a lot to our students and our parents that are you know thinking about Fisher, but then even you know all of us on campus as to what's happening here. So our iFisher Next Generation Learning Initiative, it's it's really way more than just handing someone an iPad, right? So we've got uh, uh, really it's more of an integrative approach to trying to think about how we're going to be able to you know teach and help. Um, students, you know, be better uh, digital citizens, all sorts of things uh, into the future. So it is that innovative technology, right? So it is, if you guys can see me in my little window, right? It's taking and handing an iPad, right? It's gonna be, there's a keyboard that everyone gets and then it's this Apple Pencil, which is really a key to making all of this work because it really turns, you know, basically a tablet that's something that you can read off of and, you know, click on websites and whatnot. It turns it into a device that allows all sorts of different ways to interact with it um, and really connects back, back with people's, you know, natural, you know, tendency to want to write things down. Um, but it just turns it into uh, a, a tool that, allows us to you know, draw in class and you know, make notes and do all sorts of amazing things. Now, just having the technology though is not really adequate for us to think about like making a real big step in our, in our teaching and learning environments, right? We need those spaces that Todd touched on. So we're really talking about how do we take and, and create these engaged learning spaces um, that allow us to utilize this technology. So we're talking about having um, yeah, Apple TV so that all of the iPads in the room. So when I've got a class full of, of you know, 25 students, um, all with iPads, we all have access to project our screens in the, in the room. It allows us to um, you know, have those connections, uh, it basically turns every single learning space into a, a, a computer lab um, and allows students to just get access to information like never before. And then finally, this training and mentoring. Um, so we're not only just gonna teach students how to use these tools, we're gonna teach faculty and staff how to use these tools so that we can have um, the ability to really integrate things uh, in, a, in a new way such that we're not just like substituting um, you know, maybe a piece of paper for a, a digital document on the iPad, but rather we are um, allowing our faculty uh, to create new experiences for students that are gonna to step it up um, into reimagining uh, the entire way that that you know a piece of content might be delivered. 
our project timeline for this uh, is really that you know we've been thinking about how whether or not this was the right fit uh, for us to go with uh, a one-to-one -one initiative um, for a number of years. Actually, like there's even a little bit of a timeline before this. I think I remember in 2014 or 16 when tablets were a new thing. I remember being on a committee that you know uh, we got some tablets and discussed this, and at that point we weren't ready to do anything. Um, in 18, 19, we um, convened a bunch of conversations on campus to think about whether or not like this is something that is, you know, that we're ready for um, and decided that yes, indeed, we were going to do a pilot phase. So we um, had a number of iPads um, and engaged both faculty uh, over the summer to get trained up on how to use those iPads in some pilot classrooms as well. And then a bunch of iPads to, to hand to students for the semester. Those students got to take those iPads home. Um, they were expected to bring them to class. We trained them in how to use things uh, and it gave us a, an opportunity to really see like here on campus, whether or not this was something that we would be able to um, implement in a meaningful way. We collected a lot of data over two semesters um, to see how those classrooms performed and what the attitudes were. And overwhelmingly, um, students and faculty alike, you know, were positive about that experience and whether or not, and the ability for us to bring this new tool into the classroom. So with that, um, again, as you may have noticed, uh, we, we did have a pandemic that interrupted the progress, um, but certainly you know, the, the work we had done had prepared us to um, really understand whether or not this was uh, something that we could take on at Fisher. And so at the end of last spring, uh, we made the recommendation, uh, the group working on it, to, to move forward with the, with the one to one initiative. Um, when the uh, administration, you know, accepted that recommendation and, and we dove into this process, um, we've then since ex uh, launched an extensive faculty development um, uh, campaign, basically. So we've trained over 170 faculty on how to use the iPad itself and then also how to use it in the classroom um, to help them develop teaching materials. And then this summer, we're actually gonna continue that development by having uh, a second level of training to allow faculty to move from just like the, I can use an iPad in the classroom into I can be innovative and uh, create new experiences and really push my students to, to utilize this tool as, uh, as part of a meaningful part of their learning environment. And then uh, really exciting this coming fall, actually it's starting at Great Beginnings in just a few weeks, um, we're going to be deploying uh, iPads to every single um, on-campus undergraduate student uh, for, for the duration of the year and then beyond, right? So um, all the incoming freshmen are going to be given an iPad at Great Beginnings um, with the whole kit uh, so that they can start to get familiar with it. Um, and then as we'll, we'll we're it's a lot of iPads to hand out, quite honestly, um, in a short period of time. So we're trying to phase it in. When anybody's on campus, they're gonna, um, if they're on campus for something official, they're gonna be given an opportunity to get an iPad. Um, and so we're gonna deploy this to all of these campus-based undergrads, uh, such that in the fall, the hope is that we'll have, um, you know, well, the expectation is that we're gonna have a bunch of faculty ready to implement iPads in their, in their classrooms, as well as a bunch of students ready and willing to, to learn with these new devices. Um, you know, we really have been excited about how the uh, faculty have been uh, interested in um, adopting this technology. So we did some surveying and um, in compared those surveys to, to really what the expectation is for new technology. You know, we all know that um, basically there's a whole bunch of different attitudes you can have to something new. Um, this actually the figure here with this, with this yellow line is the diffusion of innovation theory. Um, so it's a educational technology theory that says that you know in the when you have something new you're going to have a, a small percentage that three percent of people that are going to be want to be innovators and just jump right in you're going to have a little bit more early adopters and then you'll have a bunch of people that are early majority and late majority adopters and then finally some people will lag behind right so as we go from left to right here um you know this is the the people who are super excited to the people who are like oh, i'm not so sure um if we look at what fisher's faculty attitudes were is that we are skewed towards innovation you know our culture on campus is to take and try to maximize the effectiveness of any sorts of tool that we have and so we're skewed over there we want we have people who already want to be innovators and early adopters um says so that we're really we're, we're jumping into this and people are really excited um so 61 percent of the respondents you know said that they would be a catalyst for for more classroom innovation which is a really great thing and we've got 170 faculty, like I said, trained, and 130 actually got to the point where they're at, uh, certified Apple teachers, uh, meaning they've gone through the Apple training program to show that, demonstrate that they really know what they're doing with the iPad. Um, and then 88 
um, oh, I can't remember. I think 88 is the number of people who are signed up for next, uh, the next level of training, right? And this isn't a year, think about it. This isn't a year where, I mean, I don't know if anybody wants to do anything else extra on top of all of the extra that they're doing, but yet here we are as a faculty coming together to try to really take advantage of these, um, of these opportunities. Um, and I've got some example, oh, sorry. Um, and really this one-to-one -one initiative, it's like we said, it's not just handing a technology out to students to like, you know, have something else that they can check their email on. It really is gonna be able to address a whole bunch of things um, where this, like we call it an uncommon learning platform, but it's a common learning platform. This is a key, like everyone's gonna have the same technology. Um, we'll know, you know, if we have a problem, like we can tell the students, okay, this is how you solve that problem because we're all looking at the same thing. Unlike if, you know, we required all students to have laptops, um, but didn't say what laptop, you know, they could have a number of different technologies and operating systems and all sorts of things which would make it more challenging. And, you know, it really addresses um, all of these eight uh, areas that we've identified. So access and equality, everyone's going to have access to the, the information technology in, in a similar way. You know, we have 21st century expectations of what it is to, to learn in college. Um, digital literacy is, you know, even more and more important. Um, in fact, I'll give a shout out to OIT that uh, they tried to fish me with a little a fake email trying to like get me to click on a link and I, I passed their test. Um, so we want to help make help make sure that all our students have all of those digital literacy tools um, to understand how to use technology. Universal design for learning. Um, so the idea that there's a whole bunch of built in um, technologies within the iPad that can not only help uh, students that um, are working, you know, with disabilities, but actually help everybody. So if we design um, our teaching environment such that everyone can take advantage of all the tools that are out there. It not only will help our mainstream students, but it'll help all of the students that, that need a little bit extra as well. Thinking about e-resources is really important. Um, you know, digital tech, uh, digital books, e-books, um, and, and open educational resources. So like free digital textbooks that are out there um, can be utilized in a classroom if everyone's got a common reader. This next generation note-taking is something that I'm gonna actually show you a little bit about. Um, so the idea that it's not just writing down on paper, but there's all sorts of cool ways that we can um, help students retain that information better. Active learning, um, rather than you know sitting in a lecture and hearing about what's what, what has happened and what you need to learn. Um, with these technologies, we can make all sorts of really interesting active ways, and I'll demonstrate that. Um, having our students uh, become creators of digital uh, media rather than just the consumers. We all know they know how to consume. Um, they can watch TikTok all day long. Uh, we're going to be able to have, you know, in all sorts of different classroom settings under all sorts of different topics, have them create media which can be used. So I'm really excited to talk about this um, and show you some things. So jumping into this next generation note taking, um, we've uh, basically decided that uh, every student is going to have access to Notability, which is this really cool app that allows you to you really utilize that Apple Pencil in, in, in a customized way. So in addition to being able to type notes um, and you know, take you know, and, and make your own version of that information, um, with that Apple Pencil, you can, you can do handwriting. You can, uh, you can see this example down here. You can write out all of the things. You can actually capture that handwriting and convert it into text if you need to. Um, there's a button that you can actually record the audio that's occurring while you're taking a note. So when you, um, when you actually, uh, like if you wanna go back, you might be able to actually hear your professor's voice you know, as you write down an important note, you can then hear exactly what the professor said and really make sure that you understand what's going on. Um, we can record videos, we can import uh, images from other things all with just a click of the pen. Um, and so we can watch this, like, this little screen recording here. Um, on the right, we've got a student is, you know, taking notes on cell organelles and they can, you know, switch uh, pen colors, they can highlight, they can um, even grab and resize the text such that if they realize that they need a little bit more space or less space or something more important, right? So there you go. You're not going to miss that this is important for gene expression anymore. Um, import other types of media, all sorts of really awesome ways that you can utilize uh, like the iPad for test taking. In addition, you know, we can turn, well, with the addition of the iPads, every classroom is turned into a computer lab, right? So it used to be that if I wanted to do an exercise that re required internet access when I first started here 12 years ago, like it really required that I, you know, uh, uh, reserve a computer lab, have the class meet in that 
space, you know, away from our, our normal learning space. Uh, everyone would get logged in. You know, we've, we've always had really great access to those technologies, but um, it's, it's definitely something that's not always easy to implement, especially in the last second, right? So if you realize, oh, we got this far, but I, did, but I really need these kids to do a little bit more research, um, how am I going to make that happen? You know, you may or may not be able to get a computer lab uh, reassigned to you in that moment. So with the um, iPads, like every single room uh, has internet access. You know, every single student is going to be able to, to, to utilize that. Um, we can even take and then share digital documents back and forth. So this is an example of using um, uh, numbers on the iPad where I can share a template right, of this activity that we're doing and have this active learning thing where um, in real time, students can work on their document uh, or on that document in their iPad. And this assignment, I had students basically imagine a sustainable city of the future, connect it uh, in this table here with um, like what they were proposing with, um, you know, what the, um, what the class topics were, um, and then even connect that down to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, right? So it, on their iPads, they were able to access the information about the development goals. Um, they used handwriting to, to you know, make this more engaging and imported all sorts of, of uh, built-in um, icons to, to make their points. Um, but really this is instant sharing, editing, and presenting right in the class. And when we were done, I had the students project these uh, images that they had made um, right up on the screen. This little little uh, person in the circle is really key here because when we can share these documents, um, you can uh, you know instantaneously you know do that collaborative editing. And it really during the pandemic actually it's allowed me to have uh, group work in my classrooms in ways that I would have never imagined before because I have students that are you know working at home on that same document with students that are in the classroom. They're chatting over their earbuds in a breakout room, and it's been really quite amazing. Um, and then once you know we've got that finished, um, I was able to have students project this up in the classroom, um, and we were able to you know share that that uh, learning what they've learned instantaneously, which was really great. Um, the, another really cool feature about having every room be a computer lab is that with the iPads and the built in technology with this classroom app, you actually have the ability to um, gather students into a digital classroom. Um, so that when they enter the room, they all, all their iPads log into that classroom, at which point we can share documents back and forth really easily. I can actually direct them into a specific app or website um, right through this classroom app and get everybody on the same page. Um, and it even allows me to uh, you know, understand what they're working on at any given time. So like, for example, with this, with this class, like you know, we're working on, uh, on a, a specific thing in, in an app um, those students, like if someone had strayed uh, and you know started doing something else, I'd be able to be like, no, no, you got to. You're supposed to be over here. I'm working on this um, on this particular one. And then, of course, this is a really easy way for students to actually take and share their uh, work with the entire class. So this was projected up onto the screen right from that student's iPad, which allows us to to really have a really great conversation. And then finally. Um, this technology, I didn't realize it at the time, but it was allowing me to uh, utilize my classroom and extend it across the globe. So for this particular environmental science class, I actually partnered up with some faculty at the Waterford Institute of Technology, and they were, they were guest lecturers in my class on a regular basis, um, bringing their engineering expertise into this environmental science class. Um, all of this was done on our iPads and I actually use the iPad as the webcam here. So this is uh, the two faculty from Ireland uh, talking to the class and we were able to actually, you know, bring everyone together and do that same kind of like in the classroom sharing of documents. You know, the kind of thing that would be like, well, okay, you know, if I, if I had my students walk up and write on the whiteboard to talk about what, you know, the, what specific topic they were interested in, um, that was done on the iPad and shared all the way to Ireland so that we had a seamless uh, interaction. In fact, at one point, um, one of my students um, started talking with uh, uh, one of the faculty and suddenly was like, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot you weren't in the room. Um, you know, it was just a total normal conversation like you might have with your professor standing up at the front of the, of the classroom. It was really great. Um, and yeah, we'll skip that video that's in there. Um, you know, having those lectures delivered across the way was really, really, really uh, engaging. 
And then finally, thinking about this creators versus consumers. So, you know, in our typical classrooms, you know, we're having students evaluate information and synthesize, like synthesis is a really important um, part of the learning process to get to these higher levels of understanding. Um, and that's, you know, it's really great for us to do that, but um, it can be a little tiring uh, to have them always write a report and, you know, thinking about new ways that you can get the, the students to engage in these materials. And with the iPads, we have a number of, of really interesting ways. So creating movies, creating podcasts, creating, you know, uh, infographics and interactive websites and things like that that could be used are really great. So for my ecological field methods class, I actually had students um, create how-to videos um, about different pieces of equipment. So this is a student-made video where he introduced this piece of equipment, um, which is a, it's a, a bottle sampler. So this is like to collect water uh, you know, at a depth um, in a pond. They utilized videos that they recorded in the lab. They utilized videos that they um, what we captured out in the field uh, on the canoes uh, with a, a GoPro. Um, you know, combined that with text and an animation that they drew to demonstrate how you would actually um, deploy this thing, because this is, this is not a view that we were capable of getting. Um, brought that all together and created um, with actually very little instruction from me uh, on how, how to create the video, brought that all together and created this really interesting um, instructional video that now I can, you know, I can use with, in the future, I can use with other, with other classes that may not have this uh, level of expertise. Um, yeah, so really engaging way for them to become a, a consumer or go from being a consumer to a creator of this media um, with a real educational purpose. All right, so that's all the things I have to share about the iPads. Um, and I may have accidentally advanced things too far there, Katie, but I'm gonna okay. leave it and give it back to Katie. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. To finish things up. Yeah, so we're, uh, obviously you can see, we're, we're doing a lot of work with really innovative projects on campus. I do wanna just wrap up and talk a little bit more about Fisher Next. Um, so this, uh, as we mentioned earlier, Fisher Next is our platform to deliver micro learning experiences to learners outside of our normal student body. So what's really exciting about this is that we take the expertise from our faculty staff on campus who share this daily you know in our classrooms and online with our students um, but we take their their really valuable expertise and we share it with people who may not traditionally get to interact with those instructors outside so this could be professionals looking to gain a skill exploring a new topic but those individuals usually adults for, that are you know already in their profession not necessarily looking to seek a full degree program but they're looking for these micro learning experiences that could be anything from an hour webinar to a two hour self paced course to a multi week course experience. So these types of learning experiences do not lead to Fisher credit or to a degree, but they often end in a certificate of completion that's presented to the learner at the end of the learning experience. And some lead to specific continuing education credit in a specific field. Um, so you can see a number of examples on campus where we're doing some of this work and where we'd like to expand the offerings that we have on Fisher next going forward. But I'd like to share a specific example that we just ran on the Fisher Next platform this past summer and fall. So in response to the pandemic, Dr. Joellen Maples and I from the School of Education crafted a professional development opportunity for K-12 teachers to offer support in their transition to online learning during the pandemic. Just as we had to transition online, um, as you all know now, you know all K-12 schools also had to make that same transition and it wasn't any easier for them than it was for us. Um, so offering that support was really important. We developed a four week uh, professional development module that was primarily self paced, but had one live zoom session per week with Dr. Maple so teachers got to interact with her live and answer questions. The content was focused on best practices for teaching online organizing content uh, proper use of technologies on online, as well as building community with students at a distance. The offerings were a huge success and we had over 215 K-12 teachers go through this professional development experience. Um, that ranged anywhere from pre-K teachers all the way through high school teachers. We, were, we reached teachers in Rochester, Buffalo, Syracuse, all the way to the Albany area. And we actually trained an entire school district of teachers uh, in the late summer, early fall before their school year started. We were so happy to provide this professional development opportunity to teachers locally and to spread the knowledge that we have on this topic with others that were really needing it at the time. So the Fisher Next platform can be used in similar ways uh, in many other disciplines and industries. And this is an area we really hope to expand as we go forward uh, with future offerings, again, from across campus and expertise that we have to share uh, with the general community. 
So with that, um, you know, thank you again for the opportunity to share an update on the DePeters Family Center. We're really happy to share all the work that we're doing and some of the exciting projects we have coming in the future. And yeah, at this point, we'd love to hand it over to any questions or comments from the audience. So one question we had, but it looks like Mike, you might be starting to address it uh, in the chat. So one question, uh, well, comment and then question. Uh, I really enjoyed hearing about the iFisher initiative and hearing about the innovation. Can you share an example of how professors have transformed a lesson using the iPads? Yeah, I know. I think that question came right before I started talking about those examples. But yeah, just to reiterate, you know, the that city of the future example, you know, would have been one where I would have told students to go ahead and you know talk about these things in a group. You know, take some notes and then come up to the whiteboard and, and draw out something to share with the class, right? And what's amazing about the iPads is that they can do that all at the same time. Like that that step of going up to the board and drawing, um, like actually, I feel for the students, it's embarrassing, it's time consuming, it's all there's all sorts of like barriers for them to like really engage in it. Um, and we always have exceptional students that you know, get over those those barriers and, and do a good job. But, you know, with the iPads, it allows everyone to be in a little bit more of a comfort zone and create something that's way more engaging because they've got time and they're working together. They're all, you know, marking up the exact same page at the same time. Um, so those were groups of three, I think. So, they, you know, I remember they would divvy up, okay, I've, you know, I've got icons, I'm going to find some things and, you know, make some of those visuals and someone else was writing things out while they were working on the other part and then share it really quickly. So it really gives you that ability to like kind of um, to really make that happen really quickly. And then, of course, that instructional video, you know, that was one where, you know, in the past, students would have had to, you know, when we're out in the field, they would have had to find me, um, you know, and show me that they've actually like can demonstrate how to use that particular piece of equipment. Um, with the videos, it's it's be, way beyond that because they, you know, I, in the field, I wouldn't have had more than a few minutes to say, okay, yeah, you, you collected water properly. Um, with the video, I can see that they really understand what they're doing. They're putting it down in a depth. You know, they can explain the entire process. Um, and then for me to, you know, understand, like, you know, evaluate whether or not they understood the, the entire concept is, is much, much easier. Um, which is, is really quite amazing to, to be able to do that. Thank you. Um, another comment and then question, uh, such impressive work and it's great to hear that so many of Fisher's faculty are so excited about the iFisher initiative. How will students get training and how to use things like Notability? Is there a separate class that will be offered or will the professors getting trained through the center do that work? Uh, so it'll be a mixture of things. Um, as Mike mentioned, we're going to be deploying the iPads in different stages. So for the students who are freshmen coming in this year, they're going to get their iPads at Great Beginnings. And we will be doing some orientation sessions right at Great Beginnings when they get their device that day that helps them set up the device, make sure all the, the hardware is functioning and connected, get their email set up. They know how to access our tools. So to get them a really good start. They will be getting additional information throughout the rest of the summer. So through their Great Beginnings Advisor, they're going to be meeting again in July and again in August. They'll have their iPads at home at that point. So we're going to incorporate little pieces of training through the summer to make sure they're prepared and comfortable. Um, and then throughout the academic year, we're going to have a student resource course on Blackboard for all students, freshmen through seniors who have their iPads, all the information they could possibly want from the basics of setting up and getting their accounts loaded, to how to use Notability, how to use the Apple apps, how to use the tools we use every day, like Blackboard or Zoom, but on the iPad. Um, and, as, and really even additional features they may not even know are on the iPad, like some of the accessibility things you might not use every day, but when you know about them, they can really make your life easier. Um, so all of that will be a self-paced resource on Blackboard that any student can access at any time. And in addition to that, we're gonna be sending out weekly tips in the fall to all of our students. So on a weekly basis, we'll send a little note of, hey, are you starting to take notes? Here's a great tip in Notability. Or are you starting to create your first um, you know, research paper? Here's how you can use pages to help with a, a tip there. So whatever those different tips and tricks might be that help our students be more successful, we're gonna be sending those out periodically throughout the semester to make sure they have what they need um, at any time. And then, yes, obviously, one of the best places to help students is going to be the faculty they interact with. So making sure our faculty are comfortable with the tools, they know how to use it, and they know how they want their students to use it in their specific class uh, will be one of the ways that the students uh, also get support to make sure they're successful. 
you know, I don't know of anything else. I mean, other than like say Blackboard where, you know, it's going to be so infused in classrooms, you know, we don't have to train the students how to use Blackboard. Occasionally you have to teach them something, um, but they come in as freshmen and they, they pick it up pretty quick because we're all like almost, well, yeah, all of us are using it at this point. Um, so I do see that it's going to be like the learning curve for them is it's going to be pretty quick, um, especially so many of them already have iPhones and there are a lot of like this is the one of the beauties of the platform right is that um, whether it's an iPhone an iPad or a Mac like there's a lot of things that are in common um, that uh, will make it easy for them to, to jump right in. And I know we found through our pilot experience, um, you know that students are also really great at helping other students finding the tips and tricks helping in a class helping support someone else who uh, is having an issue or really it's those little things that you didn't even know the iPad did that once one student finds it, the whole class of 25 knows it the next day. So it spreads pretty quickly. So another question, what are the students saying? What kind of feedback are you getting from the students? During the pilot, they were saying, do I really have to give back the iPad? <laughs> yeah. Um, in fact, I had some that actually like they went out for Christmas and asked one because this is in the fall. They asked, you know, to, for an iPad for Christmas and use it for the rest of their uh, degrees. Um, you know, they are, um, you know, my, I, my students get a lot because I keep like over and over this semester and, and last semester, be like, oh my gosh, this would be so much better if you all had iPads, right? So um, my students in particular are really ready for it because they're excited um, to, to like do the kinds of things that I'm trying to do in class, but with something that's gonna make it a little bit easier. Um, but yeah, we've had lots of uh, positive feedback. Um, you know, it's it's some it's interesting because you know they they I think a lot of students think of the, the iPad as being something that like maybe used in elementary school or their little siblings use in elementary school, um, because quite honestly, like if you don't have the keyboard and if you don't have the pencil, um, an iPad is you know a tablet that's you know good great for like searching the web and things like that, but like it doesn't it doesn't really reach its full potential until you've got these other um, you know, human inter interface devices to, to, to utilize. And so, um, you know, I think when, when we get them in their hands and, and when I tell them about these things and I tell them about how like, you know, I show them when I'm like marking up the syllabus and, you know, highlighting right on, on a digital document and doing all these things that I'm handing out to class, um, then they get really excited about the ability for them to Kind of in some ways you know bring things together like not have all these papers that they're marking up and you know have all their notes together it's going to be really exciting for them so another question that we have is um it's so exciting to hear about how this is helping fisher help the community how can we find out more about the micro learning opportunities and will any of those be specifically targeting alumni yeah, so um, you can always visit next.sgfc.edu, which is our uh, URL for the Fisher Next platform. So you can browse uh, offerings and what's available. Yes, we have everything that we make available would be available you know, to the greater community as well as alumni. Um, and what we've done to date is offer a 10% uh, alumni discount. So for anything that we offer on the platform, there's an alumni discount. So hopefully that makes it a little bit uh, more appealing to those folks that are part of our Fisher community as alumni. Um, and yeah, we're going to be working a lot in the coming year to, to think about other offerings that we can put on the platform and, and where they would be uh, most appealing in different industries. So if anyone has ideas, we're definitely willing to take those. You can always send an email to site, S -I, or, sorry, C -I -T -E at sjfc.edu uh, with any thoughts, comments, ideas. We'd be happy to, to think about what, you, what you're thinking about and see if we can meet the need. Yeah, and I can follow it up like, in fact, like it's building, right? So I actually, um, I have a NOAA grant that's going to start this summer um, where we're going to be building a watershed education training program um, on Fisher Next um, that's going to be accessible to, you know, teachers all over the Great Lakes. Um, it focuses on um, implementing this uh, NOAA program that allows teachers to engage their students with the, the environment. Um, and so we're building out the kind of the content part of that on uh, Fisher Next. And then that's actually gonna be partnered with like field experiences that uh, community partners are gonna be um, getting teachers out uh, on the water to, to do. So um, yeah, we've got lots of ideas. In fact, actually we have more ideas about things that can go on there, I think, than we have time to implement at this point. Um, but it certainly is an exciting platform. We're looking forward to it. 
So you mentioned uh, accessibility resources for students. Can you speak a little bit more about those and how they might even relate back to looking at classrooms? Yeah, so I mean, there's a number of accessibility features on iPad that are really powerful. Um, you know, that's one of the areas that Apple's always been a strong component of making sure that the devices they provide can be used by all different types of users. And there's a lot of those things in there that will, again, be very helpful for our students who have specific learning accommodations and needs. There may actually be things that we would purchase separately for those students that we no longer need to because the iPad will provide it. Um, even things as simple as magnification of text in pretty much anything you look at can be done no matter where you are, whether you're in an ebook, a website, whatever it might be. Um, but there's other things like the speech to text. So you can have your iPad take any piece of text that you can see on the screen and read it back to you. And again, that can be really helpful in a lot of scenarios. That could be helpful for a student that is English as a second language. So they, they can hear it spoken and that may help them understand what that specific word is. Um, it may be as something as simple as our complicated kind of science topics, uh, you know, the biology, the chemistry, that specific word, the student sees it in print, but they aren't quite sure how to pronounce it. They can have it spoken to them to try to understand the pronunciation, connect it with what the professor is saying in class. It can also help someone like a student athlete who's spending a lot of time on a bus traveling to a game and doesn't necessarily want to sit reading their book, but could have their uh, AirPods on and, you know, could be listening to that book. So it may help students just accomplish an academic goal in a different place with more flexibility and mobility than we could ever provide them before. So there's a number of examples like that. Um, and I think many of them do translate into the classroom experience as well. Um, there's another feature of specifically the Safari browser that you can cut it down to reader mode so that it takes out kind of all the peripheral stuff on a website and just to the central focus of the text of what you're looking at. That can help an instructor when they're trying to present to the class and show them something from the web without a lot of distractions. It can also help a student who wants to save that as a PDF and then take notes and notability from that work. So there's, there's a whole number of, of ways that the accessibility features can be used. Um, and we're really excited about making sure our faculty know those and are comfortable with them, can promote them to students and that our students also know where to find those things to help themselves be more successful. Yeah, one of my favorite ones is actually the, the speech to text, right? Um, so not only can the iPad read back to you, but you can actually just speak into it, right? Like you can do it with your phone um, and dictate, you know, things. So I, I loathe writing long emails sometimes, but it's actually a lot easier um, to get that stuff out there if I'm just if I just talk through it real quickly and then I just have to go up and edit the grammar a little bit um, and it's it's really helpful um, especially like and I think this example of like the on the bus time right it could be a pretty amazing uh, what you could accomplish if um, if you've got that spare time uh, to, to fill in thank you so how will the I Fisher initiative and the the, the Peters family center um, how they be maintained and what do you anticipate as being the future for these initiatives on campus? There's a lot of exciting work going on and every year there's more exciting projects coming. So I think, you know, the DePeters Family Center will be an evolving place of innovation. That's what we hope. We hope to really, you know, again, focus our energy on some of the projects that we showed you today with the I Fisher initiative launching with students in the fall. We've got a lot of work to really you know, make sure that the technology is used deeply in classes, both by faculty and students. And that's not a one and done kind of project. That's a long-term initiative that is gonna be continued evolution and depth of building that technology into the curriculum um, and into many aspects of student life, even outside of the classroom. How can it be used in student clubs and organizations and all these other activities that students are involved in? So I see that initiative being something, again, that we continue to evolve and grow and expand in future years. Um, the learning space initiative, you can clearly see, you know, we've got a lot of progress. We've made a lot of traction. We're doing some great renovation this summer, not only in the DePeters Center itself, but also in the three classrooms right next door, Basel 205, 206, and 207. But that's three classrooms of about 100 on campus that need attention. So again, that's a really long-term project that we hope to focus on, you know, two to three classrooms a year. Um, and identify which are our highest needs classrooms, which need the most attention, which are our highest use classrooms, so it will make the biggest impact, and how can we continually kind of renovate spaces on campus to get them to the standard innovative learning classroom space that we're shooting for. Um, and again, with 100 classrooms, that's going to take us, you know, years to get through that. Uh, the Fisher Next initiative as well really is a long-term goal. Um, for those of you who follow 
uh, higher education in general, and then learning experiences more broadly, micro learning is, uh, you know, something that is continuing to, to get a lot of traction, especially in adult and professionals coming back looking for additional learning experiences, but that are not typical degrees. So that's, again, something that we really want to focus on and figure out where Fisher can, can be a part of that market, but what works really best for our campus. And so that's an initiative, I would say, it's still really at its early stages. And we're really, uh, you know, trying to expand. And that's going to be something over the course of the next years to focus on. So again, those are our main, and it's going to take us, you know, some years to get some real traction uh, and to really grow those to the point where we uh, want them to be. But again, every year there's more innovations, technology changes, teaching strategies change, the growth of online, the pandemic has changed online learning probably forever. And so we're still not quite sure what the future of online learning will look like when we get back to something that feels more normal. Um, and so the center will be a place for faculty to come and, and continually talk about those things, bring new ideas, and hopefully we can help support and foster that kind of innovation across campus. To add on a little bit to what Katie had said, and she had uh, raised a little bit of the attention to it when she showed the picture of uh, what the renovated Peter Center would look like, and that it doesn't look like a normal classroom, that if you look at it from a macro level, there's just looks like lots of desks and chairs and different colors, but it's the, the idea is to use it as a its own laboratory for campus. So uh, with the I Fisher initiative, perhaps there's some technology that comes in that can be tested there in a in a smaller frame that can then be implemented elsewhere from a classroom uh, facility standpoint. Uh, some of the furniture or some of the ways that we can engage power or some of the ways that uh, screens can be dropped down or lighting or all of the things that we would implement perhaps in the other classrooms as we do two or three at a time rather than spend X amount of dollars on the scale of two or three classrooms and then we realize that well that didn't work right or we don't know exactly how that will interact it can head into the De Peters Center for some period of time and it can be piloted there for three months or six months or a year not dissimilar to what Mike and the and everybody did with the with the iPads and then okay now we have an understanding of how it can be used and off it goes so um, the De Peter Center uh, is really the sort of entry point on the campus and then we the rest of us and faculty members who may not be as gung-ho or as comfortable engaging in technologies as Mike is like can go in there and get their feet wet and can dip their toe in the technology water and not feel embarrassed when they go into a classroom and, and it doesn't go right the first time. Uh, this was through our track, through the research that we did for the strategic plan, like the, the other 40% of faculty that didn't say that they were really excited, like there are reasons why and, and other institutions have found that 100% of people are interested but there's a large percentage that are fearful of not knowing exactly what to expect or if something went wrong, how to back out of it. And so the DePeter Center and Katie and Emma and Robin and everybody on the team can sort of handle that. Well, thank you very much. It's so exciting to hear about both the DePeter Center, the DePeter Family Center and about the I Fisher Initiative. So we really appreciate your time and this excellent presentation. And we thank everyone for joining us today. If you have any additional questions, you can reach out to alumni at sjfc.edu and we can funnel any questions over to our speakers if we need some additional information. Our next lecture will be on Friday, June 14th and President Jerry Rooney will give an update on the college. So thank you again all for attending and we look forward to seeing you again in June. Thank you. Have a great weekend.